I like to think about mastering not just in terms of does something sound good sonically, but also how are the decisions that I'm making affecting the emotional impact of each song? What is the song trying to say? How is it accomplishing that? And how can I use the sonics of the song to help that song achieve its goal? My name is M. Mancini. I'm a mastering engineer based out of Los Angeles. I've been mastering for about 14 years, and I've worked with artists such as Lizzo, Portugal the Man, Fits in the Tantrums, Kendrick Lamar, Common, and a whole bunch of others. So this is Larrabee Studios. Um, it is in LA. I've been here for seven years. It's really fun to work in um, a studio that's not just a mastering facility. Um, you can really kind of come in as an artist and walk in, produce a song, and walk out with a mastered record if you wanted to. My favorite analogy for explaining kind of the difference between all of the roles in engineering is the cake analogy. Tracking is obviously collecting all of the ingredients um, and, and preparing them and chopping them up and mixing. You take all of those ingredients, you put them together, you mix them, you know, you souffle the egg whites or whatever, you know, you do your magic to make the cake the way that the cake is supposed to be. And mastering is just kind of the last step in the creative process and the first step in the um, sort of technical process of releasing a record. The nice thing about being a mastering engineer is usually when I come in, everybody else has been on the project for either months or years already. And I come in with a fresh perspective, a fresh set of ears. Um, it's a lot easier for me to kind of make decisions about what something should sound like because I'm not super attached to the entire journey that the song has been on before it got to me. So I work completely in the box these days. It's completely digital. Plugins have really gained that same level of nuance that analog boxes used to have. Ozone has been kind of my, my um, centerpiece for a lot of stuff. My main arsenal is always the maximizer, the exciter. I'll use the multiband dynamics, not necessarily for multiband compression, but sometimes as like a very basic three-band EQ sometimes. If there's a lot of issues going on in the bottom, that's a really helpful tool to just sort of use it unconventionally as an EQ instead of as a compressor. I use MSEQ a lot. It's probably the one thing that goes on everything. Even if I get a mix that comes in really loud and I'm not, you know, adding any compression or limiting or volume, I'll still do a little bit with MSEQ in order to maybe emphasize the lead vocal in the center. Trucks are coming in really stereo these days, even with lead vocals, everything seems really wide. Um, and I like to emphasize stuff in the center in terms of, you know, I still think a song is a piece of art and I try to emphasize, you know, what's the most important thing it's going to be in the center. Um, you know, I want to think about what are these lyrics and why are we paying attention to them. So I just finished working on the Kendrick Lamar album, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, and that was a pretty unique experience. He came in and listened to it before I was done mastering, before all the mixes were in. We had demos in place. He was really involved. Um, which was which was great. It was just a little nerve-wracking for me because I'm not used to presenting an artist or anybody else with an unfinished product. You know, usually I'm in a room by myself. The mixes are typically done, um, or you know, per it's particularly in an album setting. For example, I'll receive the majority of the album, I'll master it. You know, we'll do some tweaks. Maybe a couple of songs will get mixed tweaks that'll come back in. Um, but I won't be mastering demo versions of songs or, you know, incomplete mixes um, and have stuff kind of evolving as we go. I won my first Grammy. It was for John Baptiste's album, We Are. That album is very eclectic stylistically from beginning to end, which made it really fun to work on, but also very challenging because how do you make you know, this big, huge dance track and this blues song and this quiet piano interlude all fit together and sound like they belong in an album together, um, which was a challenge, but it was fun too. There, there's, um, he's got a lot to say on that album and he has a very specific reason for why he chose all of those songs and that becomes apparent when you listen to it. So I really loved that he wanted to piece that story together on an album together. I'm really proud of the, of the work that everybody did on that album. 
um, there was a lot of love in it. And I think you can, you can hear it when you listen to it. Let's head into the mastering room. Uh, I've got some tracks loaded up and you can see how I master using Ozone 10. So the first thing I want to show you is John Baptiste's album. I did a whole bunch of different stuff on here because the album is really varied. So the first song I want to show you is called Cry. Sometimes when there's one song on an album, there will be one mix that just doesn't want to get as loud as everybody else. And I'll have to push it and it will end up distorting. And I can't bring it down to a volume where it doesn't sound too quiet but stops distorting. So what I'll end up doing is actually bringing the declipper from RX in to come and save the day. But I'll only put it, um, I'll, I'll end up breaking the song into pieces so that I'm only treating the parts that are distorting. And that way I um, preserve kind of the way that I wanted everything else to sound without it being affected by the declipper and the limiter that, that is engaged when you use it. Yeah, so the declipper will be the last thing on the chain because usually it's, it's distorting because of the amount of volume that I'm adding um, or it'll be distorting because of the amount of volume in combination with the amount of low end or with any combination of the amount of things that I'm using. For some reason, some mixes just don't want to get loud and there's nothing I can do to change their mind other than adding the declipper. And so that'll go at the very end of my signal chain to just grab whatever that distortion is and fix it. I did a lot of um, overarching kind of vibe adjustments to all of the tracks based on what John wanted. And a lot of that was done either with the exciter or it was done with the multiband compressor. On this particular track, I ended up using the vintage limiter. It's not doing any limiting. I'm just running audio through it because I liked the way that it made it sound. It just gave it a flavor. That's something that I really enjoy about the, the vintage pieces or modules in Ozone is they, they have a sound. Even if you're not engaging them, they, they have a vibe to them. And um, I appreciate that they're sort of true to their name as something labeled vintage. Like a piece of vintage gear, you can just run audio through it and it will give you a flavor. The John Baptiste album was really special to me even before I ended up winning a Grammy for it because there not only was it exciting and challenging um, from you know a sonic perspective because it's so varied you know just stylistically in terms of the productions there was a couple of different mix engineers on it which always is is fun for me you know it's kind of like the the master engineers version of a crossword puzzle you know trying to make everything fit together not only was it special to me for that but John has, he just exudes this joy and this exuberance in his music um, and being able to, having to, to kind of absorb that myself and then help elevate it was really an inspiring experience for me. In mastering, everything happens on one stereo track. Each song is getting mastered separately, but at the end of the day, when I'm compiling an album, I'm treating it as one, one full project. With John Betty's, you know, the whole album lives on one stereo track. Kendrick was a whole entire other story. I've got four stereo tracks. So the majority of the music of the album is still living on one stereo track. All of the songs are down in, on track four in this particular session. All of the rest of the tracks are different interludes, different choir pieces, spoken word. There was one instance for an interlude that we added at the last minute for Kendrick, it was a spoken piece that didn't sound like any of the other spoken pieces that were on the album. And somebody was worried that they were going to have to send it back to the mix engineer to get it, you know, mixed to sound the same. And I said, just give me, like, go away, come back in five minutes. I just need five minutes. Um, and the f what I pulled out was ozone. Um, I did it really fast. It was kind of just a panic. Let me see if I can make this happen so we don't lose any more time that we don't have. When I'm in a time crunch and I've got to do something in emergency, ozone is basically the thing that I pull out. It's my box of hats. I've been really lucky to work on, on quite a few albums that have meant something to me. The Kendrick album was really special to me for that reason. I didn't expect to find a song about trans acceptance in the middle of a hip hop album. Um, particularly one that I was mastering in a rush while it wasn't completely finished. 
that song was still a demo when I first heard it. The song I'm talking about is Auntie Diaries. Um, I was, it was one of the few moments I was very happy to have been by myself because I had to stop and put my head down. Um, I'm not sure if I've had that experience with any other album in my career. The song is called Coronation. So the first thing I do when I get audio, if it's not at 44.1, I will convert it to 44.1. So I want to be mastering at the same sampling rate that um, is being reproduced at the consumer level. The first thing I do is I'll, in this case, we're going to open Ozone 10. Um, I have a couple of things that I've got kind of pre-lined up. I'm not necessarily going to use all of them, but I want them all kind of here in my toolkit. I've got my equalizer, which is currently in stereo for the moment, but I will uh, switch it to mid-side at one point. Using it in mid-side is what allows me to um, maybe isolate the vocal or isolate the snare or the kick and to try and affect those parts of the song without having a significant impact on the rest of the track, which is um, kind of the name of the game when you're working with a stereo file, which is what typically I'll get from mix engineers. That's um, often first or second in my chain. Um, sometimes I'll have a limiter uh, beforehand, but in this case, I'm not going to be doing that. The next thing I have is uh, the vintage compressor. I don't always use it. Um, I have everything set up in a certain order, but I typically go from the beginning to the end when I'm mastering. So I'll set up like my initial volume at the top of the chain, I'll set my volume at the end of the chain, I'll set my maximizer up, and then from there I'll work back. Um, but the second thing in the chain is the vintage compressor. Um, I always want to have um, the longest attack time possible because I don't want to step on transients. I also have the um, auto gain turned off. I don't want to be distracted by volume changes in terms of what compression I'm doing. Um, the next thing that comes in is this nifty new impact module, which I am just getting to know and seems really powerful. Um, I've just been using it on the low end so far. Um, so I'm going to be looking at that in a little bit. Here's my dynamic multiband compressor that I talk so much about. <laughs> I typically have it set up. I have compression turned off on everything. So I don't want to just turn it on and have it start changing the, the shape of the song immediately. Um, so I have compression and limiting turned off, and I usually just have one band at the bottom. That's often what I'm going to when I'm reaching for this tool, is I need something with the bottom, either control or more of it or less of it. Um, and sometimes I just use it as, as a wideband EQ, and I'll just be boosting this with volume without compressing or limiting or expanding. The second to last thing in my chain is the exciter. I call it my cheat tool because with the exciter, I can often bring all of the energy and excitement that limiting will bring to a track without any of the um, negative impacts of limiting. So I'm not going to be stepping on any of my transients. I'm not going to be killing the energy in my bottom end, but I am going to be bringing, um, you know, it'll bring the, the energy of the sides up. It will bring a lot of the same sort of sense of squeezing and glue that a limiter will bring, but without actually doing damage. So, so I call it my cheat tool. I almost exclusively use it on the top end. I don't really use it on the bottom. Um, I find that, that there's such a high risk of muddying a track when I do that, that I, I just, as a general rule, I don't use it. I usually have two bands set up. I've got one from around 1K to around 8K, and then one from 8K up. And lastly, I've got my maximizer. I've always got it on the, the, the last mode in transient. That is the only mode I use. Typically, I have a slower character. The faster things act, the, the faster I'm, I'm stepping on stuff. So I, I try to keep a slow character. Um, and I, transient emphasis was my favorite uh, new feature back when it first came out. <laughs> um, so I always have that on kind of by default. And it's... Um, typically around 86 to 90%. And the soft clip, it gets me there when nothing else does. 
without really significantly changing the way that something sounds. We're not going, you know, I'm not just distorting the whole track or anything. So I, I was surprised to find um, such a, a, a significant amount of use out of that as a mastering engineer. Sometimes when um, I'm listening to a reference version of the song and there's a lot of limiting going on in it or a lot of compression and it's bringing a certain element of energy that I want, but I want to achieve it without, you know, killing my bottom end. I've, I've found that sometimes just adding a tiny bit of the soft clipper will um, bring that grittiness and that energy that was in the reference version without doing the damage that the reference version has that I'm trying to avoid. And then the last thing is, of course, output volume. Um, I will make, um, just, you know, if something is not loud enough, um, I'm not interested in limiting something more because it's not loud enough, I will just make it louder. The first thing to have, if, especially if you're working on something new or something that you haven't heard before, is um, a reference of something else that will give you kind of a, a basis point for volume because that'll help you st not listen to something at the wrong volume. Um, which will affect the decisions that you make and not in a good way. Like, for example, this came in really quietly. This is, this is a really quiet mix. So if I'm just playing this flat with nothing on it, it's going to be this loud. Um, and as an example, a different song that is already mastered. Um, same volume on my, in my room. So those are different volumes. <laughs> the first thing I'll do once once I've got my chain set up, once I've got my audio in, is I will um, kind of just set levels so that I'm the song is approximately as loud as other things that that I'm going. I'm just trying to get it as loud as everything else so that the decisions I'm making about limiting and compression and EQ are not based on trying to get the song to be louder, but they're based on how much compression and limiting do I want to use. So. Um, okay, so we're quiet. Now that I've set my levels, I've got, you know, the next thing I do, I want to set my maximizer and my exciter will come shortly after that in terms of, to me, those two, those two tools go hand in hand. Um, so I'll set my limiting ref, uh, levels. All of this stuff will get adjusted. But again, the first thing I want to do is get um, sort of like the solid basics in place so that I can make more informed decisions about everything else that I make. I kind of, I go overall and then I slowly zoom in more and more as I go in terms of details and where in the song and stuff like that. So now that I've got my maximizer and my exciter set, I've got my volume set. Um, now I'm gonna kind of start making decisions about, you know, where does the vocal sit? How do I feel about it? Um, how much sparkle do I have in the song? How much more sparkle do I want? Um, typically, I've always got um, a high shelf. It's usually between 15 and 16 K, which sounds really high, but it and it's not adding like a ton of stuff, but it will just give an extra sparkle to the song. It's it's um, it's not intended to be a huge impact or a huge change, um, but it it does add a little bit of sort of that polish that I think a lot of people associate with mastering. And I will always, when it comes to high-end um, EQ changes, I almost always make those in stereo. Those, that's one of the exceptions. That's why I start with this plugin in, um, in stereo. <laughs> um, I always want to make, it, I don't want to change something in the sparkle in the center and not on the sides because it's going to make the song sound weird. So, in this song, what I'm going to do here is around 15K. I'm just going to add a half a dB. After that, I'm going to switch to mid-side because I want to concentrate on the vocal. So that's what I'm going to listen for now. Uh, 
Um, and the nice thing about this EQ is that you can solo the band and just kind of move the frequencies around and you can listen and kind of decide what which particular aspect of the vocal you want to be treating. Uh, my cue for this is usually 0.8. Typically, my, my cue will be really small, like maybe 1.1 is the tightest cue I will get. Um, I also don't typically ever make huge gain changes and adjustments, but for, the, for visual purposes here, I'll show you. Just randomly, I chose five so that you can see that the shape of the curve is really wide. Um, and it's not, it's, so it's going to be making overarching changes. A tighter cue would, would affect, you know, a very small portion of the frequency range. But in mastering, it sounds weird. Don't do it. <laughs> For me, something that will be a, um, like a very tight, specific decision, that'll be a cue of like 1.1 or 1.2. That's as, that's as thin as I get. Um, and so I'm typically, I, I hang out at around 0.8. I'm also never making a 5 dB gain on anything. I don't think you'll ever see me use more than a dB and a half or 2 dB um, of EQ on anything. Um, more than that, not only does it typically make the song sound strange, but it won't give you the effect that you're going for. So if 2 dB of EQ isn't making the change that you want to make, then you shouldn't be using EQ to make that change. It either needs to be a mix adjustment or you need to use a different tool. Um, so I'm just going to listen again to the vocal and kind of decide Okay, I also want to add a little bit of sparkle to the vocals. Um, I'm going to go back to stereo to do that. I'm going to do that around 5k. Um, that's going to be my, my crazy tight cue of one. Um, and I'm going to listen to that. That's going to be on both the vocals and the sides. Um, so it's going to affect the background vocals too and any sort of like cymbally sounds as well. So it's, it's um, something you should be careful about. If you accentuate, accentuate it too much, then you might, um, you might get something tinny or harsh. And if at any point I start to lose perspective on my volume, I'm just going to go back and check. There's no rule that says you can't. Um, I'm hearing a lot of boominess in the low end on this one. I'm going to go back to my dynamics and I'm going to pull out that same frequency area that I found problematic. Just going to make a new band. I'm going to turn all this stuff off because I don't want it to affect me. <laughs> and I'm just going to solo looking for that muddiness. I'm just going to try dropping that by a half a dB. So all of the decisions that I'm making are all small scale in comparison to the sorts of decisions that mix engineers make. Um, I know I usually decisions get made in several dB at a time. I'm usually making decisions at a half a dB at a time. I'm going to turn this on and off without looking so I can decide if it sounds more or less muddy by taking a little bit of that frequency band out. I like it better um, on. I'm going to try dropping it more just to see if it makes it better or worse. Of, with no borders. It's 
db over here and that's so i'm reducing a half db which this is not very typical for what i do but <laughs> there it is i'm going to try the soft clip thing that i was talking about before see if that gives it a little more presence a little more forwardness i'm i'm missing something and i'm not sure what it is so let's see if that is if that gives it to me i'm talking about liberation from our story of separation we're together we find salvation Yeah, that's what I was missing. So now that I'm happy with that, um, the way that this program works, instead of being track-based editing, I do object-based editing, which means my plugins are directly on the stereo track. So if I want to affect a different part of the track differently, I have to split it into pieces. So I'm going to do that. And now I'm going to go over here. I'm talking about a liberation from our story of separation. But together we find salvation with the corner. What I'm doing now is I'm isolating the other choruses because I'm probably not going to be changing those. The production on this song builds a bit, though, so um, I'm going to look at the the last verse or the last section. Could be the bridge in here too. Um, so that sounds pretty dark to me compared to the choruses. So I'm going to brighten that up using the exciter a little bit, and if that doesn't get me where I want to go, I'm going to go back to EQ as well. I'm going to break this up into a smaller piece here. Just this little spoken piece. Welcome to the coronation. I'm going to raise the volume on it a tiny bit. Just a half a dB. Welcome to the coronation for all creation. Gets an invitation to a new world order. I'm talking about liberty. Sometimes when you raise the volume on quieter bits, you lose the impact when it goes into the chorus, and I want to avoid that, so I'm gonna try. Invitation to a new world order. I'm talking about liberation. I'm talking about liberation. I'm going to copy what I did in this section with the brightening, and I'm going to bring it over here and probably add to it. But just so I'm starting in the same place. Um, this is my little copy paste tool over here. Borders. Just around the corner, the crown can come from the ashes. I'm also going to add a little more um, around 5k, and that's going to be in stereo as well for the moment. Get the we find salvation, love with no borders. It's just around the corner. See, when I did that, I feel like um, now the guitars. The acoustic guitars on the on the sides are sticking out too much, and the vocal is still buried. So now I'm going to go back into mid side. On the screen, there's um, you can choose to affect the mid, and then you can affect the sides. And it is both sides that you affect, so you don't have to like choose one or the other. It will affect both of them for you. Um, what am I doing over here? Five twenty two. So I'm just going to do a half a dB on the sides, 
and I'm going to try a DB and a half in the center. Get the wheat find salvation love with no borders. It's just around the corner. The crown can come from the So that allowed me to brighten up the vocal in the center without it getting too distracted with the acoustic guitar stuff on the sides. Welcome to the combination. This first chorus is a little quieter than the second one, so I'm going to just add a tiny bit more on the maximizer to compensate for that, just so that it has a little more impact. When I'm breaking a song up into pieces like this, I always make sure to listen to the transitions between the pieces and make sure that I'm not, um, like, for example, bringing a, a verse up so high that when we get to the chorus, it no longer sounds interesting. Um, so that's one thing I always try to make sure, you know, when you're getting distracted, cutting things up into little pieces, always make sure that what's the first rule of saving a life? Uh, do no harm. You know, do no harm. All creation gets Sit in our humanity. Welcome to the combination. Welcome to the coronation for all creation into a new world order. I'm talking about liberation. I'm also going to go back to my other song and just take a quick listen to what level the verse is at and see. These productions are super different, so it's it's just kind of a sanity check, I guess is the right word I'm looking for. But. It's an invitation to a new witness as usual. Witness as usual. Just around the corner. Sit in our humanity. Welcome to the combination. I'm going to add a little bit of bottom end to the choruses as well. Um, and I'm going to make sure not to boost the part that I'm already reduced. For that, I'm going to use EQ, and I'm going to use that in mid-side as well, because I want to boost it in the center. Um, boosting low end on the sides usually just adds mud and confusion. It doesn't necessarily add impact. So um, particularly when I'm using EQ, I don't boost low end on the sides, just in the center. So I'm going to turn that on. So I liked 73 because it, um, I felt it more kind of in my heart. Um, and this song is talking about, you know, a new world order, I think making the world a better place. So I'd, I'd like to feel, I'd like to feel s some way about that. And as long as that frequency is also, I think, sonically, a good one and it isn't going to add mud then that's i'm going to make my decision on that frequency sort of more from an emotional place than from a sonic place so for my decision making for a song like this i noticed that it's a song where the production builds consistently throughout the song so that's why i started mastering it at the end i want to create the best the ideal sounding ending and then from there i worked backwards um, in order to make sure that the the parts with lesser and lesser production and instrumentation were still sounding exciting and intimate and that the vocal was clear. Um, I didn't want to overdo it because again, if you, and that's also why you want to start at kind of the loudest point of a song is if you start mastering from a quiet part, that mastering that sounded great in the verse is going to be distorted and way too loud and really messy on those loud bits. So I always start with the loudest part make that sound great, and then you can kind of work backwards to bring up um, some of the quieter bits that are maybe too quiet. This song, to me, just gave me a really a hopeful and intimate vibe, so I wanted to preserve that. I focused on making sure that some of that energy in the bottom end was, some of it was, was a little superfluous, and it was adding mud rather than adding impact, so I took a tiny bit of that out. Um, and so that, that was kind of what my what my intentions were while I was working on that. 
Um, the last thing I'll do is um, make a track marker. Track markers are, um, if this was a CD that we were printing, where I put this marker is uh, where the track would start um, when you hit next on your CD. In this case, it's just where a song starts on, on your streaming device. Um, I'm going to title this. It's the main version. I mastered it. That's my signature. And there you have it. That's that's the that's the song. I think the thing that I bring to mastering that's special is I'm I'm really emotional about you know I, I care viscerally about how a song feels in my body when I'm working on it and how that's going to impact a listening experience. That's to me that's sort of like my prime directive, you know, um, and that's that's something that I think I've always had. I've always you know, had a really emotional connection to making art and making and elevating every form of art, including music. I think there's generally in the world this misconception that either you have it or you don't, especially when it comes to audio engineering, either you have the ears or you don't. And that's not true at all. You can train your ears just the way you can train, you know, to be a better soccer player or, you know, you can become a better cook. You can train your ears. It's not something that you either have or you don't. It takes time. You have to listen to music a lot and you have to do it critically. I put the work in, I put the time in, I put the, the hours in. So that's something that I always like to encourage other people because I definitely went through a period where I thought, I'm never gonna make it. I just don't have it. I don't have it, you know, and that's not true.